Okay, so full disclosure, I saw this online. I am not a big social media person. For those of you who know, I don't have a Facebook page. And I had one one time about six years ago. I was like, oh, you know what? I'll, I'll get a Facebook page. Then never wanted one. I got one and it turned out to be more of a headache than I wanted. So I deactivated it. I have an Instagram page. I haven't been on it in probably four or five months. So, you know, for those of you that might be wondering, oh, I haven't seen any posts of yours lately. Uh, I, I kept getting hacked. And so I just said, F it. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Um, Twitter, I don't get active on Twitter except for news, like, you know, updates of what's going on and stuff like that around my city. I don't care about national news because none of it's good. So that's the only thing I go on Twitter for, or if there's, you know, things like that. Um, and then LinkedIn, I used to really like LinkedIn because I could find business stuff. And then uh, LinkedIn's kind of turned into a crap show as well. But every so often, if uh, uh, mainly when I, Cambria is sleeping on me, and my just don't really want to watch a video or anything. I'll scroll through like LinkedIn or something like that just to see if I find anything good. And I did stumble upon something that I found really interesting, which is called six things mentally strong people do. So I clicked on it and I looked at it and I thought there was some really powerful stuff there. So then what I did is I took those six things and I said, OK, let me extrapolate on this. And I did some more research and wrote out some more notes and created a class based around it. So that was really strong stuff. My overall reason for telling you that is I didn't come up with this on my own. Okay, It was just a long winded way of getting you to know that. Um, also a long winded way as a reminder that social media can be fun and exciting, but you don't need social media to do fairly well in life. Okay. So there you go. All right, so six things mentally strong people do. So let me start by asking a question. Anyone here ever have days where you mentally just don't have it? Just me, good. Yep. Okay, so I'm the problem. Yes. Bunch of goddamn lies. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> There are days where mentally you just don't feel like doing the work. You don't feel like getting up. You don't feel like doing the prospecting, doing the practicing, all those other different things. Everybody has those days. As a matter of fact, when we do our business plans, we calculate those days. We always tell you when you're trying to figure out your day's worth, if you've never done it in the past, is we say, you know, have there ever been a day where you go to work and you're, but you're not really at work? Everyone says, yeah, we'll calc add one day a month. So it's 12 days a year. So roughly two weeks out of the year, you're not going to be working just because mentally you won't be there. Now, here's the thing though. People that are not mentally strong have that happen all the time. Or they have it happen and they can't get out of it. So one day turns into two Two day turns into three. Three days just said, oh, screw it. It's already Wednesday. I might as well not even work this week. Okay. And then it just carries on and on and on and on and on. And for some people, it goes on for months, a year. I mean, there's a lot of people that in 2020 and 2021 just gave up. I'm not talking about the people that were sick or had family members sick. That's different. I'm talking about people that or we're fearful of it. That's different. I'm talking about people that weren't really sick, didn't have family members that were definitely sick, weren't really concerned about what was going on, just simply mentally couldn't get out of their own way and couldn't be productive. We had a number of people do that even in our own organization in the last couple of years. And now the problem is some people haven't still haven't gotten back into it. So it's vitally important that we constantly are working on our mental strength. Now. What do you think? Do you think mental strength is as important as physical strength? 
Well, I, I would tend to agree with that. That yes. mental strength is just as important as physical strength. Sure. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. So I hear stories all the time of I'm going to the gym, I'm working out, I'm lifting weights, which are all great. And I encourage everyone to do that. But are you working on your mental strength? Are you doing things to make you stronger mentally, not just physically? Okay. So it's vitally important that you're doing those types of things. So here are six things, but not necessarily written in any of order of importance, just like always. Six things that mentally strong people do. Separate mental strength from those that can't get over those humps on days that they just don't feel like doing the job. All right, first thing here. Number one is they move on. They move on. They don't waste time feeling sorry for themselves. First thing mentally strong people do is they move on. They don't waste time feeling sorry for themselves. Does everything in your real estate life go according to plan? <laughs> no, no. Rochelle's had her license for like a week and even she's saying no. Okay. No, not everything goes according to plan. Most of the time, you're surprised if anything goes according to plan. Okay. But you you can't feel sorry for yourself. You just have to move on. You accept it for what it is and you move on. Okay. Deal falls out of escrow. Okay. Well, was it my fault? If it's not my fault and it just is what it is, I can't dwell on it. I can't go, oh my gosh, this always happens to me. Well, let me tell you something. If you have that mentality, it always will happen to you. You know that? Everybody you know in life that just says things like, gosh, of course this happens to me. If I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. God damn it, I hate that statement. If I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Or it always happens to me. Woe is me. That person will always have that stuff happen to them. Guaranteed. You have to move on. You can't waste time feeling sorry for yourself. Like you're the only agent that's ever had a deal fall out of escrow. You're the only agent that's ever had an appraisal come in short. You're the only agent that's ever had a buyer not actually qualify for as much on their pre-approval letter. You're the only agent that couldn't overcome a commission objection. You're the only, like you're the only one. So we feel bad for ourselves. Oh gosh, of course this happens to me. I really needed that paycheck. I really needed this. You move on. You can't dwell on things like that. Okay. You just have to simply move on. Now learn, learn from the mistake. Was it your mistake? Was there something you could have done different? But the more you dwell on things, the harder it's going to be on your mental state, which is then going to cost you more money because it's going to take you longer and longer to get back into production. Okay. Deal falls out of escrow. The downside of our business, I've said this many times, there's one downside to our business in real estate. And that is that so many hands have to touch a file for it to close. Meaning you could do everything perfect perfect to perfection when a plus plus you did an amazing job nothing else you could do and the deal still might fall apart because there's two agents there's a buyer there's a seller there's a title there's escrow there's insurance there's a loan officer there's an underwriter there's a funder there's an appraiser there's an inspector all these hands have to touch a file and everyone has to be totally in sync for it to close. So you can't be so frustrated if something falls apart because of an appraiser. It's like nothing I can do. Okay. You move on. You go find another deal. But here's what I wrote down also under number one. It is in order for this to work, you have to prospect every day. In order for this to work, you have to prospect every day. Here's why. If you're prospecting every day, will you generally have leads in the pipeline? Yes. Other than Duke? 
Does anyone agree with that? Yes. Okay. Yes. I've got yes. three. Yes. Four. Yes. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Yes. Some of some of you are sitting there. Some of you are thinking prospect every day. This guy's on drugs. If yes. you prospect every day, you will generally have leads in the pipeline. When you have leads in the pipeline, are you totally distraught when one goes away? No. You're going to be upset. Yeah, of course, you're going to be upset. You don't want to see a lead go away. You don't want to see a deal fall apart. But when you have another one, two, three, or four ready to replace it, you're not as bummed out. When you don't prospect every day and you only have one lead and your entire mortgage payment, rent payment, credit card bill is based on that one lead closing and it falls apart, then it's tough to move on. So it's vitally important that you are hunting for business every single day. <clears throat> All right, number two, they embrace change. They welcome challenges. Six things mentally strong people too, no, do. Number two, they embrace change. They welcome challenges. Okay. In our business, does anything ever just stay the same all the time? No. Think about the last two and a half years. Think about the last two and a half years. Who had Okay, who had, when they put together their 2020 business plan in January, a global shutdown on their business plan in January, 2020? Anyone have that? Anyone in 2020, their, on their 2020 predictions, did they have interest rates going to 2%? No, <laughs> nobody had that. I didn't have that in my, my 2020 predictions, my 2020 business plan, I didn't have that. It happened, right? Two and a half years of, can I do open houses? Can I not do open houses? Can I wear, do I have to wear a mask? Do I not have to wear a mask? Can I evict tenants? Can I not evict tenants? Can I even show property? Is real estate an essential business? Can I door knock? What can I do? What, I can, what can I not do? What forms are this? What forms that? What do I need to get signed? Every day there was something new. Then we get out of that, right? And then we jump right into interest rates are at 5%, 6%. Prices might be going down. There's less listings. This is closing. Are there going to be four? Like, it just, it just never ends. It never ends. There's always going to be something, okay? There's this technology. There's that technology. I heard this one's the best, but now they've got this one and they've got this one, right? All this stuff is constantly changing. If you don't embrace change, you're done. You are toast in the world of real estate, in the world of life. In the world of life, you are toast if you don't embrace change. Okay. And what happens, mental people that are not mentally strong, they don't embrace change. Well, you're stuck. Okay. You can't adapt. You can't change things. You can't move forward because you're not, you're not mentally strong enough to embrace that. You're not mentally strong enough to embrace the challenges. You just have to simply accept the fact that change is going to happen. And you can either run away from it or fight it, but you will lose. You will lose. So you embrace it and you say, great, this is changing. This is a new challenge. I mean, Zoom. Who here prior to the pandemic used Zoom or some sort of virtual platform for anything? Anybody? Might be a couple of you. Yep. Now it's how we run our company. You know, I never used Zoom. I had heard of it. We, you know, kind of dabbled into it a little bit, but I, I was, it wasn't my thing. Well, March 18th, 2020, I had to figure it out pretty quickly. And now it's like, how the, why didn't we do this in 2018? <laughs> why did it take a global pandemic for us to do this? I mean, we've got Carlos, you know, uh, Uchua is from New Jersey. 
and he's here with us. We have people from Long Beach. We have people, Yukiko's in San Diego, you know, Corona, all kinds of Franks in Illinois. Like, it's crazy to think that we didn't have, we didn't do this until a pandemic came along. And now it's like, man, this is, this is crazy. You embrace change or you will fail. Number three, six things mentally strong people do. They stay happy. They stay happy. They don't waste energy on things they can't control. They stay happy. They don't waste energy on things they can't control. I tell you, man, it is. The, the, in my opinion, I have no scientific evidence or data to support what I'm going to say next. In my opinion, in my opinion alone, the biggest hurdle to becoming mentally strong is getting rid of the negativity that's around you. It is, that's, that's the biggest thing you have to overcome to stay mentally strong. And in today's world, is it easier to find negativity or positivity? Negativity. Negativity. I just told you why that I'm not on social media very often. Okay. One, I'm not going to be an influencer, so I'm not going to make any money off of this. And two, two, I don't care what you had for lunch. That's number two. And number three, I don't want to hear you bitch and moan all day. Okay. Thank you. It does nothing for me. And so, and in real estate, people, real estate agents post one of two things either things that they're complaining about, trying to make it funny, or two, lies. So real estate agents post. I'm number one. Not everyone can be number one. Okay. Look at this listing, this wonderful listing. Yeah, that's great. That's a nice listing. It's not yours, but I'm, <laughs> that's so nice of you to post it. <laughs> you know? But the negativity, you have to try your best to eliminate that, okay? Now, the part of the problem for some of us, not for all of us, but for some of you, you're the negative one, okay? Now, I'm not trying to get rid of you. What I'm trying to do is shift the mindset around, like, you know, I don't know, almost, I mean, let's be honest, I really don't know hardly any of you personally. I know you business, but I don't really know many of you personally. I think in our entire company, I've only, truth be told, I've been to Neil's house and I've been to Melinda's house. I don't think I've been to anyone else's house. So my point is, is I don't know you personally, but if you're one of those people that's super negative, I could probably tell you things aren't that bad. Okay. Yeah. Life can suck sometimes, but I mean, if you live in Southern California and you're unhappy, that's your problem. Okay, Carlos, you don't know what I'm talking about. You live in New Jersey. Now, Carlos, I did live in New Jersey for a year, so I get it. But we don't have to deal with winters. Okay, Rochelle knows Buffalo. Okay, we have to deal with that stuff. If you're unhappy in Southern California, that's on you. Okay. And I get it. I am the biggest advocate of Los Angeles and Southern California. And, you know, I wear that badge proudly, but it's like, it's, I mean, at my house, you know, the beach is like right there and it's like 85 degrees. It's behind you. Yeah, well, I know. I know. I, have the, <laughs> I, I didn't want to turn my head. I have another window right there. Um, like, if I'm unhappy with that, that's my problem. What's wrong with you? You wake up every day where people are dying, literally, no joke. People are willing to risk their lives to come here. As many problems as we have in this country, and I will admit we have some, people are willing to risk their lives to come here. Every day. 
They're willing to hide in tunnels overnight while helicopters fly around. They're willing to give every dollar they've ever scraped up to pay people to help them get across borders or help them get across the waters or whatever the case may be. They're trying to get their families and different types of things. They're doing everything they can to come here despite whatever problems we may have. And then if you live in Southern California, they're not trying to come here to get to Kansas I'm not going to fight all through all of that to try to get to Topeka. I'm trying to get that so I can get to LA, so I can get to Orange County, so I can get to New York, so I can get to wherever. And yet some people live here and are just so disappointed about life. What? Come on. That's what mentally weak people do. Mentally strong people, it's like, man, I got a good thing going here. Yeah, life gets hard. Life sucks. I, You know what? Believe it or not, for some of you, I have really bad days. Some of you are like, Robert, you're always so happy. You're always so chipper. Yeah, I do my best, but there are times when I'm not in a good mood. Okay, everyone's guilty, but for the most part, man, life's good. So you have to embrace that mentality that overall life is good. And here's the beauty of it. If you don't think your life is good, you have the ability to change that. Whether that's, Hey, you know what? I could pick up the phone today and I'm going to make a hundred contacts until I find someone that wants to buy or sell a house that could get me 15 grand. 15 grand is certainly something that could make your day better. Okay. You have the ability to change that. You have the ability to go door knock. You have the ability to learn something. You have the ability to do something different. If you don't like where you live, you have the ability to move. This is what I tell this to agents all the time on calls. They say, well, they, they want to sell, but they're fighting me. They don't know if now's a good time. Why do they want to sell? They don't like where they live. It makes no sense to me. <laughs> think about this. Let's, let's think about this logically. I don't like where I live. It's 2022. You have planes, trains, automobiles, boats, whatever. You have the ability to go anywhere in the world. You just have to buy a ticket, which means you have the ability to live anywhere in the world. Why would you choose to live somewhere you don't like? I, it makes no sense to me. I don't like where I live, but I think I should wait. <laughs> Why? You live anywhere in the world. Now, I'm not telling you that if you don't like where you live, you have to go move all the way to Paris. But you can move to a different street. Move. I don't like where I live, Robert. Move. <laughs> it's crazy. Right? The different mentalities. All right. Number four, six things mentally strong people do. They are kind, fair, and unafraid to speak up. They are kind, fair, and unafraid to speak up. Mentally strong people do not try to bring other people down. That's crazy. Like, and you don't have to like donate to charities or anything if you don't want to, or you don't have to give a large amount if you don't, if you don't want to, or you don't have it. But I mean, how hard is it when you're walking into Starbucks and you see somebody walking out with two cups of coffee in their hands to just hold the door open for them? You know, how hard is it to say, please, thank you. Do you know, I've asked this question before. I think some of you got it. Do you know a fat, which in the, in the country, United States, which fast food restaurant wins the award every year, every year without fail for best customer service? Chick-fil-A. 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 Chick every year without fail wins the award. Now, I don't know how they calculate these awards, okay, or who, who gives them out, right? I didn't, you know, might be like, I think it's right after the Oscars. It's the Oscar after party. <laughs> fast food awards. Chick-fil-A wins every year for most from best customer service. And here's the thing. They say Chick-fil-A of all the restaurants in terms of surveys done is the or fast food places is the place that has the highest percentage of people saying that they get a thank, hello, thank you, have a nice day. Hello, thank you, have a nice day. Chick-fil-A said above all else, that's the place to get it. And they win the award every single year. Now, I have no idea if this is coincides with one or the other, but do you know that which, my pleasure, yeah, thank you, Noel. Do you know which fast food restaurant 
is the most profitable in the United States? Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A. Now, I have no idea if those are connected. I'm going to assume that has something to do with it. Yeah, the chicken sandwich is great, but it's, you know, it's not like you're getting a Mastro steak for, you know, $10, right? And just simply by being kind. And they win that award every year. They're the most profitable. And keep in mind, they're only open six days a week. So all the other fast food restaurants get a seventh day to make money. They do it in six. There's no reason to be rude to people. There's no reason to be mean to people. It just doesn't make any sense. Okay. The, the oldest, oldest adage there is, is treat people like you would want to be treated. So just simply be kind and be fair. Mike Ferry told me this years ago, and I think he shared it at a retreat as well. He, he said, told this to us in a coach's training when we were, no, it was probably four or five years ago. And he said, we have to understand in real estate that if it's a win for the seller and not a win for the buyer, that's not a good real estate deal. And if it's a win for the buyer and not a win for the seller, it's not a good real estate deal. It has to be fair for both. And sometimes we forget that we're, we're trying, no, 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 uh, we're trying to screw this buyer out of this. We want to get everything out. And it's like, you're not being fair or you're a buyer and you're trying to squeeze everything out of the seller. You're not being fair. Everybody wins if it's fair. So be fair. Don't be unreasonable to other agents. Don't be unreasonable to clients or anything like that. It's got to be a win for everybody. So be fair. Okay. Don't be un, don't be unafraid to speak up. It's okay to speak up. It's okay to stand up for yourself. It's okay to sit, speak your mind. Now keep in mind that that doesn't guarantee that people are going to like it. But you know you have to have some principles. You have to have some morals. You can't let things fester either. At some point, you will explode, right? It's like the, uh, the movie Anger Management with Adam Sandler and Jack Nicholson. Everyone, anyone ever see that movie? It's great. Goose frog. But he tells them, right? He tells them in the movie, he says, Adam Sandler's trying to convince him, saying, I'm not really an angry person. He said, well, there's two types of angry. There's, there's the person who is very outspoken angry, right? And they go in and, and they, rob the, they rob a liquor store and this and that. And then there's person B who just keeps everything festered inside, festered inside, festered inside. And then one day, instead of robbing the liquor store, goes in and shoots everybody, right? And he's saying it as a joke. I understand in today's times that the analogy probably wouldn't be as funny. Okay, because of what we're going through. But the point is, is that if you don't speak up and it festers, it festers, it festers, it festers, it will eventually come out. I do this on coaching all the time. You come to me with an idea, Robert, I want to try this. Let me get your thoughts. And every single time I will tell you, go do it. Even if I don't think it's a good idea, I'll tell you, go do it. Here's why. Because you're going to do it anyways. So I can either disagree with you and push you to not do it, which will make you resent me. And I don't need any help. I don't need any help with you resenting me. Hey, Robert. <laughs> yes. I feel pretty. <laughs> there, you go. I feel, there you go. Yes, there it is. Perfect. Right. I don't need any help with you resenting me. So I'm not going to do that. But number two is that even if I tell you I don't think that's a good idea and you don't do it, it's going to stay in your mind. I really want to try it. I really want to try it. I really want to try it. And then it's going to keep festering up, festering up, festering up until you finally just do it. And you might not even do it correctly. So I'll always say, oh, no, go try it. Get it out of your system. All right. So go do things. All right. Number five, they're willing to take calculated risk. They're willing to take calculated risk. Mentally strong people are willing to take calculated risk. So there's a difference. Calculated risk is when you 
write out a plan of action, you write out uh, uh, profit and loss potential, you write out you know when you can expect to see some returns, and you go for it. Risk is all on black. Okay, this is the difference. <laughs> okay, <laughs> mentally strong take calculated risk. So let me give you an example in real estate terms of calculated risk. You know, Robert, all of my business comes from these, you know, I have some great referral sources, but they're all low income properties. They're all $200,000, $300,000 properties. And it's great. You know, I got business coming in and, and all these other different things. But I, I don't, I want to get out of that. I, I want to go to a higher marketplace. Okay, well, then let's create a plan on how you're going to break into the higher marketplace and get more money. But knowing that in order to do that, you're going to have to take, that's going to take time, which means you're going to have to give up some of these deals at the two, $300,000 mark. And mentally strong person says, let's go. You got to think long-term. I'm thinking long-term, I'm thinking bigger. I'm going to do this, even though I know I'm going to lose some of the two to $300,000 deals. I'm going to lose my now paychecks, but I, I, this, is the, this is the risk I'm willing to take. That's a calculated risk in terms of real estate. All my business comes from a certain area. I want to break into this market. I want to break into this city. Okay. I want to do this. I want to do that. Okay, great. Come up with a business plan, figure it out, and you might lose some money. You might lose a few things on the way. You might lose a few partners on the way, but you're taking a calculated risk to go do something bigger. You know, we do this in recruiting all the time. Well, Robert, I'm at 100% split. Your company doesn't offer 100% and you have to, and you pay an 8% franchise fee. Yeah. So, would you rather close more deals and make more money or make more money per deal? Would rather make more money per deal and we're not your place. But if you want to take a calculated risk and trust, trust that Neil knows what he's doing, that Robert knows what he's doing, that Cindy knows what she's doing and the system knows what she's doing. And you're, yeah, you're not going to make as much money per deal, but you're going to make more deals and make more money. Then you take that risk. We do that in recruiting all the time. And agents sometimes have to make those calculated risks. So you have to be willing to do that. You have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone. You have to be willing to do something, some things different. That analogy I gave you of the low income properties to the higher end properties, that was me. That's where the analogy came from. When I got into sales, I have no idea how I even got into this referral source. I don't even know where the guy came from. But somehow I connected with somebody who worked. Here was the, the, here's the best part. He was a real estate agent. Or no, I'm sorry. He was, he was an agent. What he would do is refer me business. And he would, he spoke Spanish. And he did for people that were coming from Mexico to the United States to purchase property, he would help them. And he would send all the deals since when I was doing loans. He would send me all the loans. Now, again, I don't remember where I met this guy. And two, I don't speak very well Spanish. Okay. Yo quiero comer. I want to eat. Ma cerveza, por favor. I've lived my whole life on those two statements, and it's gotten me to this point today. <laughs> but the point is, so again, I had no, no idea, but I was, but he kept sending me all these deals, which was great, but they were all, because you have to remember, this was a lot, this was not yesterday. So these deals were 150, $200,000. My office was in Beverly Hills. So I have all these other people in my office. I'm closing 12 deals a month for $3 million in volume. They're doing three deals a month for $5 million in volume. I'm like, damn it. You know, so I had to take that risk of saying, I appreciate what this guy is sending me, but I don't want to do these deals anymore. I want to go to the Beverly Hills. So I had to take that risk and kind of give up those to go get the bigger deals. It worked, but I had to take that risk. Okay. But I had a plan. I had a plan in place. Actually, I wrote out the plan. I did this a couple of years ago. I wrote out the plan and I found it, found it. 
a couple of years ago, I found it. Now that this plan was again, years ago, I found the plan and this was before, this is kind of scary. This is before I'd ever met Mike Ferry, ever even knew who Mike Ferry was. And the plan that I wrote out, I kid you not, I'll find it again. I'll share it with you is a Mike Ferry plan. Terrifying. I shared it with him one day. Cause it was literally like make so-and-so amount of contacts a day looking for referrals. It was work on my, you know, scripts on objection handlers on why they don't want to work with me. It was track all of my, my, like it was a written out plan that you would see at a Mike Ferry plan. I'd never met him before. It was terrifying. The guy was in my psyche. I didn't even know it. That's how good he is. All right. Last point here. Six things mentally strong people do. Number six, they celebrate other people's successes. They celebrate other people's successes. Everybody should celebrate their own success. That's not a mentally strong thing. That's not a mentally weak thing. Everybody should celebrate their own successes. Okay. So That's let me start with that. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, let's start with that. Everybody should celebrate their own successes. In our business, when you face, let me tell you something. I get it that we, we go through these trainings and we talk about it and I think sometimes we might make it seem as a coach, as a trainer, that it's like, gosh, all you got to do is this, this, and this, and this. I am well aware this business is really hard. Yeah, she's in summer school. I am well aware that this is a really hard business, not only to get deals, but just the frustration of being rejected so many times. I am fully aware of that. Okay. Neil is fully aware of that. Everyone's fully aware of that. So when you get a deal, when you do something good, you need to pat yourself on the back. You need to say, good job. You need to celebrate the wins. You need to do those things. Otherwise, what the hell are you doing it for? You know. So first of all, you have to make sure you celebrate your own wins. That's not an ego thing, okay? I think sometimes we don't celebrate. You know, that's, that's an ego. No, it's not. I got a listing. That's a really big win. That's a really cool thing. I'm celebrating that. I got a buyer into escrow. Is getting a buyer into escrow easy? <laughs> it's no. Yeah. Okay. It's not easy. So when you get a buyer into escrow, you celebrate that. That's exciting. Why do you think we ask for wins every day? And some of you don't share because you think your wins are too small. It's crazy. You know, Rochelle's like, I did a buyer consultation today. That's a win. That should be, a I was excited. Still excited. Right? I got a lead. I got this. I did this. I'm like, celebrate it. But going back to that last point here is you also need to celebrate other people's successes. Okay. You can't resent me. Oh my gosh. I hate it when they get deals. Well, then you're in the wrong room because you're in a room with people that get a lot of deals. <laughs> I have other real estate offices I recommend you go to because that, that don't do a lot of deals. You'll love it there. <laughs> <laughs> you'll love it there. They don't do any deals. You're not going to have any resentment. You'll love it. You, you want to come here? You're going to hear about it. So you can either get pissed off at everybody or just, hey, cool. Good for you. I'm in the right room. I'm with the right people. They're doing deals. I want to do deals. I want to be a part of the fun. I want to be part of the excitement. This is really important in real estate. There's enough deals for everybody. There is enough deals for everybody. Okay. So it's okay. Celebrate other people's wins. Celebrate other people's successes. You know, I'm a, I'm a Mike Ferry guy, for example. But, I, you know, when I see things that Tom Ferry or Brian Buffini or someone else did, I'm like, damn, that's cool. Good for you, man. You know, I know coaches for the Tom Ferry organization one day. Robert will learn how to speak. I know coaches for the Tom Ferry organization and I congratulate them all the time. Oh, good for you. Oh, you did that? Wow, that's great, man. Yeah, I took one of, your, one of your people left and came to our coaching. Good for you. I hope you helped them better than I did. I'm not upset. I want other people to succeed because I want to be around people that are succeeding. It helps me. So it's okay to celebrate other people's successes. It's okay to, you know, want to be around those type of people, but it's also okay to want to beat them. Okay. I mean, it happens all the time. It's just friendly competition. 
but you have to be okay celebrating other people's successes. It's just how you get better. And it's how you stay focused. And the last thing I wrote down on that is in terms of celebrating other people's successes, just because somebody's successful doesn't mean you can't beat them. And it doesn't mean you can't work that area. We used to get this in Long Beach all the time when years ago when we were growing that office. Well, do you think I should work Long Beach with Melinda and Nancy working here? Real questions we used to get because Melinda and Nancy are like two of the biggest agents in the state. And they both work in Long Beach. Well, do you think I should do that with them working here? Anyone want to guess what market share combined Melinda and Nancy have in the city of Long Beach? I'll give you a hint. It's five. Oh, sorry, I gave you the answer. The two of the biggest agents in the state, they combined have a 5% market share, which means there's a 95% other market share just in that city, let alone if you wanted to work the surrounding area. Don't ever let one agent, you can you know, be happy for agents, but don't ever let them discourage you from working in an area and don't ever let them discourage you from that you can't beat them. Best example I ever give of this is Karen Bernardi. Karen Bernardi is the Michael Jordan of real estate. In her career, has made over $60 million in commission. Not volume, gross commission earned over $60 million. For those of you that aren't good at counting, that's a lot. Okay, 60 million. You would think in Boulder, Colorado, that if Karen Bernardi went on a listing presentation, the seller would just go, here you go. <laughs> Why would you list with anybody else? It's Karen Bernardi. It's like being a basketball coach and saying, hey, Michael Jordan's available and going, ah, no, nah, I want somebody else. Hello. <laughs> okay. And yet, Karen Bernardi gets the listing contract signed 88% of the time. Now, 88% is really high, but that means 12% of people say, I'm good. Why can't you be one of those 12% that beats the Karen Bernardi in your marketplace? If 12% of people are telling Karen Bernardi no, then whoever the best agent is in your marketplace, 20, 25, 30% of people are going to tell them no which means you can beat them. They're beatable. So don't add, you celebrate other people's successes, but don't celebrate it too much where you don't think you can compete with them. You don't think you can work in the same area as them. It's crazy. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. Questions on whatever we went over today. Whatever we went over today. Questions on what we went over today. Yeah, um, I apologize for joining late. Can you go over the first four again real quick? First four, yes, I can. I most certainly can. Okay, number one, six things mentally strong people do. They move on. They don't waste time feeling sorry for themselves. That's number one. Number two, they embrace change. They welcome challenges. Okay. Number three, they stay happy. Stay happy. They don't waste energy on things they can't control. Okay. Number four is they are kind, fair, and unafraid to speak up. And number five, just for everyone, anyone else, they are willing to take calculated risk. Number six, they celebrate other people's successes. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Very good.